I ended the last video <clears throat> by beginning to formulate a new worldview that can unite Americans and motivate them to improve the American civilization during this time of pivotal change. Were we able to ask the great philosopher of civilization and 1952 Nobel laureate Albert Schweitzer about the state of American civilization, he would probably say something to the effect of, American civilization is so entrenched within and dependent upon both the material and now the virtual that they have completely abandoned the spiritual and lost their shared worldview rooted in humanitarian ideals, motivating them to perfect individuals and communities alike, ideals that should be protected and adapted to modern conditions. Of course, I haven't a clue what Schweitzer would actually say, but I do know he did say things like, quote, material achievements are not civilization, but become civilization only so far as the mental habit of the civilized people is capable of allowing them to aim at the perfecting of the individual and the community. He saw the spiritual perfecting of individuals as the progress of all progress. Schweitzer was clearly of a humanist tradition that sought self-realization as the supreme goal, and he was writing in the years following the horrors of World War I, attempting to create civilized, civilized societies following the most atrocious war until that point. He believed that civilization had collapsed primarily because there was no unifying, optimistic, ethical worldview prioritizing the perfection of individuals and communities alike. He saw modern societies as having a worldview that's largely opportunistic and self-serving, that, that had contributed to unprecedented material advancement, but he believed that neglecting the spiritual side to be a grave mistake, suffocating the society and leading it to the utter incivility of modern warfare. According to Schweitzer, in order to become civilized again, the society must begin to concern itself with the spiritual and provide a new shared worldview with reverence for life as its core idea. Reverence for life is exactly that, the respect for all living beings, and any disrespecting of that, according to Schweitzer, would be unethical. His view is nuanced, however, as he understands that sometimes we must, or feel we must, hurt another living entity in order to survive, but when we consider a money-grubbing, profit-driven society like the U.S. that has cor corporations more than willing to pollute, sheer rainforest, bald, overwork labor, and drive down the cost of labor, throughout the world, it's obvious that this modern system has very little reverence for life. It seems to be more reverence for profit regardless of whether or not it harms life, surely a continuation of the opportunistic worldview described by Schweitzer in 1923. Writing at the same time as Schweitzer, Bertrand Russell occupied himself with similar questions and echoes Schweitzer when he writes in his political ideals, quote, material possessions in fact or in desire dominate our outlook, usually to the exclusion of all generous and creative impulses. He furthermore states that the society, quote, stunts the lives of men and women enshrining a ruthless possessiveness in all the respect which is given to success leading men to fill the greater part of their time and thought with the acquisition of purely material goods, a terrible obstacle to the advancement of civilization and creative energy, end quote. We value success in the U.S., but how should we define it? Is it merely the acquisition of material goods, especially money, as most Americans see it? Or does it also include a wealth of wisdom and life experience, or, or also the depth of one's mercy? Regardless, a new worldview must begin to focus less on the material and more on, the, on wisdom and equani equan equanimity, what, can, what we can begin to see as the spiritual. Writing in the U.S. the century before Schweitzer and Russell, transcendentalist and naturalist Henry David Thoreau summarizes perfectly the prioritization of profit and the material over life when he states in his life without principle that if a man walk in the woods for love of them half of each day, he is in danger of being regarded as a loafer. But if he spends if, if he spends his whole day as a speculator shearing off those woods and making earth bald before her time, he's esteemed an industrious and enterprising citizen, as if a town had no interest in its forest but to cut them down. 
This quotation also highlights the great paradox of civilization. There is no civilization without exploitation at the foundation. Name any civilization in history, or any modern society for that matter, and you will see some combination of environmental degradation, economic coercion, poverty, corruption, overconsumption, ideological violence, slavery, etc. A truly civilized society should act in a negative utilitarian manner, attempting to minimize its exploitative side and ensuring the negative is not able to become commonplace and come to thrive. We must work through this paradox and consider how it plays into our worldview. We must also consider that America as an idea is itself a true paradox. Depending on where you are in the world, merely uttering America evokes pride and devotion among some and bitter hatred among others. But who's right? What's difficult to grapple with is that both sides have merit. The United States historically has contributed astoundingly to progress in governance, science, technology, etc. So its positive role cannot be denied. However, based on everything I mentioned in the initial video and everything you see happening at home and abroad, can you deny the negative impact? The United States has lost its civilization pre precisely because it has become so polarized and has lost those ideals that had made it a city upon a hill and a beacon of hope to so much of the world's wretched refuse. I speak today to attempt to suture the wounds that keep this country so deeply divided. Our loss of civilization is reflected in our hate-filled rants we spew and the verbal and sometimes physical abuse we commit against one another in the name of one ideology or another, and profit is a goal regardless of how it is made, even if it may devastate entire communities through waste runoff or automating and outsourcing. The people profiting largely don't seem concerned with the plight of the many, even though the many suffer due to the fiduciary responsibility and economic models of fragilistas in power. When writing about the nascent nation that was the U.S. in 1835, French philosopher of democracy Alexis de Tocqueville lauds the Americans for their enlightened selfishness compared to the pure selfishness of Europe. When discussing American individualism, he writes that, quote, I do not think on the whole that there is more selfishness among us than in America. The only difference is that there it is enlightened, here it is not. Each American knows when to sacrifice some of his private interests to save the rest. We want to save everything, and often we lose it all. And they sure did some 80 years later during the First World War, but I digress. It's safe to say that we have lost our enlightened selfishness, with it retrogressing into the pure selfishness of imperial Europe. We must regain the enlightened aspect if we want to have any chance to restore the civilization. We must also re-examine individualism itself, and what form we want to exist in this country that was once celebrated for its individualism. Do we want the classical form of the Scottish Enlightenment that Tocqueville ultimately alludes to with the term enlightened selfishness, or the atomic individualism of the French Enlightenment that believes that consequences are not important as long as the individual's liberty is not impeded? Consider it simply. A classical individualist who smokes will refrain from smoking around those who don't like it, whereas an atomic individualist will not care about the other's feelings and smoke no matter what. It seems as if the classical individualism that had made America great, and it, it, it was the classical individualism that had made America great, and it's the atomic individualism currently ruining it. So now, let's actually begin to rein everything in and construct the worldview, which is a conceptual scheme of ideas and values that influence how we interpret and interact with the external reality. It is ultimately our intellectual orientation provided largely by the world around us that helps us to understand the world, ourselves, and others. Of course, biological factors play a role, but it's also important to remember that humans have evolved in order to adapt to their environments. That's how a baby born in the U.S. can grow up, speak, can grow up in China speaking impeccable Chinese. How a child taken from a hunter-gatherer group in Amazonia can come to be a successful business person in Sao Paulo. Worldviews help people to navigate the world around them and make sense of and interpret what they experience. It is our little approximation of and defense against the constant state of ignorance in which we all, all dwell. 
worldviews serve as part of the unconscious foundation or background of our thought, affecting how we interpret and act within the world. It's why we react negatively to some ideas and positively to others, why people are motivated by some combination of money, family, productivity, creativity, and truth-seeking, and others' different combinations. The ideas, knowledge, and values of our worldview shape our interpretation of the world and drive our motivations and decision-making. We cannot act in the world around us in any meaningful way without a worldview. Worldview construction is the work of philosophy, and myriad worldviews have emerged throughout human history. The Taoist worldview, for instance, emphasizes living in harmony with nature and cherishing nature, and a, a contrast to the prevailing worldview at the time that, according to Lao Tzu, encouraged status-seeking, covetousness, and a turning away from the Tao, or the way of nature. The universalist Christian worldview, much like the Stoic worldview, treats members of outgroups the same as those of the in-group, seeing everyone as children of God. It discourages violence and encourages people to live simply, free from material desire, so that they may earn everlasting bliss in the afterlife. Such a worldview leads many to devote themselves to the improvement of others and the world around them, but bastardized versions of it have led to heinous violence. The task here today is not to discard or to discredit old worldviews at all. As a student of the perennial philosophy, I believe that this new worldview must be born of great ideas from the past that are in line with any worldview advocating peace and harmony, like the Taoist or the Christian ones. After all, God likes loving atheists more than spiteful Christians, or does he not love us all the same? Moreover, as a student of philosophy and science, I understand the importance of facts and knowledge and how they impact our behavior. This new worldview, if it is to be successful, must combine the humanitarian spirit of religion with the rigorous pursuit of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom inherent in philosophy and science. Most importantly, that humanitarian spirit must have the ideas of reverence for life and a few others at their core. So instead of keeping the idea of worldview general and abstract, let's bring in the work of Leo Apostle to give it some scaffolding. He sees a worldview as an ontology or a descriptive model of reality. It is the amalgamation of all of our language, knowledge, belief, values, and biochemical predispositions that have all been internalized and serve as the unconscious basis of our interpretations of the world motivating our behavior. He asserts that a worldview should do six things. First, it ought to have an ontology explaining the world to some, some capacity. A worldview is not necessarily correct, though it purports to be. For instance, a scientific worldview sees humans as resulting from a long process of evolution, whereas some re religions have stories of anthrop anthropogenesis that completely contradict evolution. Regardless, the worldview being begun today needs nothing of such talk. Moreover, Apostle says that a worldview must have a futurology, or a prediction of where a particular group or humanity as a whole is headed. Some see humans as tumbling toward an apocalypse, whereas others see that we have reached a sort of teleological zenith and are at the end of history. Apostle further states that worldviews must have values, must answer ethical questions about right and wrong and how to act, what we could, can call an axiology. When we see a large group of people suffering, your worldview determines how you respond. Will you try to help them, try to profit off of them, or look at them apathetically, or even schadenfreudenly? This question leads us to the fourth part of Apostle's formulation, which is praxeology, or a theory of action. How can we best employ our ideas and act in accordance with our values and also achieve our desired goals? The values and praxeology are largely guided by the worldview's epistemology, or its theory of knowledge, the fifth part. What does the worldview accept as true and false? How should we treat new knowledge, especially knowledge that comes to conflict with what we believe to be correct? For instance, at, what time, at one time, the Catholic worldview entailed geocentricism, or the idea that the sun revolves around the earth. Such a fact served as an explanation of reality as it is. However, the work of Nicholas Copernicus challenged this belief, and heliocentricism has since become part of the scientific worldview. What is fact according to one worldview is not necessarily according to another, which can often lead to problems, and it's why a worldview needs a theory of knowledge. 
And finally, Apostle says that a worldview must provide an ideology or a discussion of how the worldview came to be constructed. To what problems does the worldview respond and what are the elements of it? So now that we know these six elements and how they provide individuals general scope of understanding the world around them, let us address each one. As far as this worldview is concerned, we needn't address things like cosmogenesis or human evolution so as to be open to Americans of all forms of ideology. The description of the state of affairs began in the first video with that shocking, shockingly long list of problems and the explanation as to how the two-party system enables or exacerbates these problems by capitulating to wealthy donors, corporations, the military, intelligence communities, and special interest groups, and prioritizing short-term profits over over societal well-being. The problems exist largely because of a private system of campaign finance that favors the wealthy and private interests and enables them to write regulations in their favor and vote down regulations against their interests, a system that Sheldon Wolin has termed a managed democracy or an inverted totalitarian state where a small group is able to take control of a democratic structure and use that structure to defend themselves against any objections from the public. It's an incomplete explanation, as it does not provide the entire history since 1968, but it is a step in the right direction. And if you agree with that analysis as to how the society is how it is, then you like the worldview so far. As far as this worldview's futurology, it doesn't seem necessary or even possible to make specific predictions. But one can say, based on the last video's list of issues and how they are exacerbated or ignored by the managed democracy, that the situation will only worsen if we take no significant action. One can predict that people in power will continue to want the masses to be divided and will still use their mainstream media and other tools to ensure it happens. As long as there is no will or, well, or way to change anything, the situation will only gradually worsen. Numerous movements, ranging from the Tea Party movement to Occupy Wall Street, from the Sanders campaign to the Trump campaign, from Black Lives Matter to Blue Lives Matter, demonstrate that there is mass discontent among the people at large, and that is going to boil over in many ways, including more mass shootings, violent protests, police brutality, online trolling, alcoholism, drug addiction, etc. This vo video focus focuses specifically on the axiology or the values and ethics epistemology, the tr theory of knowledge, and praxeology, the actual theory of praxis. The ideology should be apparent along the way. The values and theory of knowledge are the most essential part of this worldview as they inform the praxis. So what are those essential values and ideas and approaches to knowledge that we should begin to internalize and apply to our behavior? We've already heard about Schweitzer's reverence for life, or the concern for all living things, and Tocqueville's enlightened selfishness, or the willingness to sacrifice some of your own prosperity for the well-being of the whole, what can also be referred to as classical individualism. As was discussed in the last video, I consider myself a negative utilitarianism, a negative utilitarian, which means that I feel we should be prioritizing the minimization of suffering, especially during this, pa this pandemic, as opposed to the maximization of happiness, not that the society is even truly utilitarian, as it prioritizes short-term gains for the few, as opposed to the long-term well-being of the many. But I digress. In addition to these ideas that we ought to incorporate into our intellectual orientation, we must also draw upon Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty, meaning that we each have positive and negative freedom, or the active freedom to do something and the passive freedom from having something done to you. Throughout history, these two freedoms have come to conflict in many different realms, whether it was between slave owners having the freedom to enslave or the slaves having the freedom from enslavement or the civil rights movement having the freedom from discrimination against the Jim Crow supporting Southerners' freedom to discriminate, or the labor movement having the freedom to have a say over allocation of profit against management's freedom from labor's demands, or the feminist freedom to be financially independent against a freedom to enforce dependence upon them. Where there are conflicts 
over rights, oftentimes there is a struggle of two opposing freedoms, and we must consider both sides in order to move forward effectively. Furthermore, the society must begin to value skin in the game, as developed by Nassim Taleb in his Inserto series, meaning that we ultimately need to value accountability among the people who make the most substantial decisions in our lives. As it is now, no system holds people to account, enabling people in power to transfer all of the risks and negative externalities of their decisions onto taxpayers, laid off workers, exploited labor around the world, the environment, etc., all while profiting handsomely and never needing to worry about being fired. It's how Rick Snyder is able to make a decision poisoning Flint's water supply and doesn't even need to care. How American liberals and conservatives alike have been able to profit off of the deaths of millions in numerous countries around the world during the war on terror, and how big pharma execs have made untold millions off of mass opioid addiction throughout the country. Is this really just the, justice? Is this anything other than a totalitarian state with a two-tiered system of justice where a small number of people are insulated from the law all while orchestrating a system ruining lives at home and abroad and profiting off of it all, all while the average citizen has absolutely no say about it and cannot hold these people accountable? Instead of the deeply fragile system exposed in the 2007-2008 and COVID economic crises that essentially explicitly rejects skin in the game, why do we not strive for one of actual accountability? And not, and not just one of accountability, but one of robustness and even anti-fragility, where we gain from the unexpected and chaotic. By anti-fragile, Talib means those things that are actually improved by chaos and, and disorder. That instead of crumbling fragilely when something negative happens, you actually find yourself in a better position after the chaos. It exists at macro levels and micro levels as well. Do you despair at getting fired, a fragile response, or do you see getting fired as a liberating opportunity, a robust anti-fragile response? Do the haters get you down or only motivate you to prove them wrong? We can internalize this concept of anti-fragility and, and apply it at both micro and macro levels and make the society at least a little more politically, economically, socially, and emotionally robust, right? When considering the future of the American civilization, one must also assess the American value of success. What is it to succeed again, right? The spiritually, intellectually, and ethically impoverished American society values material success almost exclusively, caring not for wisdom or the well-being of the people. This is a society that encourages people to sacrifice deeply held convictions in the relentless pursuit of money. It is a society that is more than happy to keep people existentially insecure and submissive than give them a lifeline and do anything to improve their worlds. This is the Hobbesian state of nature, an, ir an ironic fact considering this nation was founded upon Lockean ideas which emerged in response to Hobbes's philosophy that had been used to justify absolute monarchy. The Founding Fathers were proponents of Locke's ideas, especially that of the social contract, where the government works according to a contract made between the governed and the governing. If it is established in the social contract that the people should have the freedom from government in position, that government does not have the freedom to impose. The social contract is largely the negotiation of negative and positive liberties, both the freedoms of the government and the freedoms of the individuals. The government only has the freedom to impose upon someone if that person has violated the freedoms of others. This stance directly opposes that of Hobbes, who believed that human nature was brutish and warlike, quite unsurprising when you consider the context in which he wrote, leading humans to require a leviathan government that essentially controls all aspects of their lives, proffering them little, if any, freedom. Locke had a more nuanced conception of human nature, feeling humans to be neither inherently good nor bad, instead believing that each individual is a tabula rasa, written on by the environment and culture. If the society has faith in the people and treats them well, they will be a decent people, just as if it treats them as brutes, they will become a brutish conniving people. In the U.S. and its managed democracy, there is no longer a social contract between the people at large and those in power. And there is no system putting the people in, 
people in power's skin in the game. Instead, there is an establishment, one could even say a deep state controlling things, being comprised of unelected individuals and policy institutes, intelligence agencies, the military industrial complex, universities and corporations, as well as elected individuals in DC. They are largely kept in power by a professional class, a powerful group of New York Times and Wall Street Journal reading, MSNBC and CNN watching, NPR listening, well-educated, well-heeled, self-righteous, virtue-signaling individuals who look down upon anyone who isn't of their ilk, ilk, who defer to the establishment every step of the way. Neither the establishment nor this professional class care about public service and even laugh at anyone for advocating change. The American virtue of public service is dead and it must be invigorate, reinvigorated, just as a value of historical knowledge must emerge. All of these ideas and values are effectively useless unless people collectively believe in them and try to apply them in praxis. When ideas reach this level, they have entered what Yuval Harari calls the intersubjective layer of reality, an integral idea in both the axiology and epistemology. The intersubjective layer entails the knowledge, belief systems, values, etc. of particular groups, and it is what ultimately ties them together and enables them to act collectively. For instance, intersubjectivity brought together crusaders in Europe and the Middle East to fight in large numbers against one another. Both sides had their collect collectively accepted myths imbuing divine significance upon their actions. Were their actions actually divine? Well, at the very least, one side was definitely wrong, but that ultimately does not matter because they both had very strong convictions guiding their actions. Every community has its own intersubjective layer. In fact, no community really can act collectively without it. At a basic level, there is no physical element within a $100 bill that makes it actually worth $99 more than a $1 bill. It is only because of intersubjectivity that those two are actually different. If there is no one there to believe in its value, the value ultimately does not exist in reality. Same with a concept like human rights. Human rights don't actually exist in reality unless there are people who collectively believe them and promote them. In order to gain any traction, this worldview, or at least the ideas therein, must work its way into the intersubjective layer and be channeled into productive directions. As we transition into the epistemology with intersubjectivity, we must also touch upon another idea essential to this entire worldview, Marcus Aurelius's directing mind. While there's certainly debate about the extent to which humans actually have free will, we cannot deny that we do at least have some significant executive control over our minds and bodies, even if that executive control comes to be guided by impulses and biases. Aurelius recognized the power of the flesh over the mind, writing that, quote, this being of mine is made up of flesh, breath, and directing mind. Don't then let this directing mind of yours be enslaved any longer. No more jerking to the strings of selfish impulse. No more disquiet at your present or suspicion of your future. The directing mind must be trained and cultivated. It does not become perfect overnight. In fact, it never becomes perfect, but it can always be developed. The directing mind is the seat of those ideas and values accepted intersubjectively, intersubjectively that influence our daily reality. We need to begin we need to begin to incorporate these ideas into our directing minds if they are to become part of the intersubjective layer. Now that we've touched on a few central ideas, we must also go into the worldview's epistemology or treatment of knowledge in order to be civilized and avoid any sort of extremist violence. It's important to be skeptical and critical as opposed to dogmatic, trying to help people to understand your view as opposed to denigrating them for not seeing things the way you do. We must accept that we will always know less than what we don't know and live in a perpetual state of ignorance and can only ever truly know reality approximately. We think we know things for certain, but a skeptic accepts that some of those things are false and will change once proven to be incorrect. A skeptic doesn't deny everything, of course, as no one can function meaningfully without accepting the truths of various things, no matter rightly or wrongly. When it comes to gleaning truth, skeptics have various tools to help them move forward. 
For instance, one, consider, one can consider Popper's criteria for truth and or accuracy. Typically, people, depending on different situations, assess the truth of various ideas and statements in one of three different ways. One being the correspondence theory of truth, another being the self-consistency theory of truth, and the final one being the pragmatic theory of truth. The correspondence theory essentially means that people accept a statement as true if it accurately corresponds to the thing it is describing. Essentially, we accept the statement of that house is on fire if we see that the house is indeed immolating. But we wouldn't accept it as true were the house not to be ablaze. We immediately deny 2 plus 2 equals 5 because it does not correspond to reality. Furthermore, people also like self-consistency. They accept statements as false if they're inconsistent, and all too often ideas and entire ideologies fall to the wayside due to their inconsistencies and inabilities to explain reality accurately. Popper recommends that in abstract matters where correspondence is not readily perceivable, statements can be accepted as possibly true if they are self-consistent. Finally, Humans often accept an idea as true if it makes them feel good, which is the pragmatic theory of truth. If it works for someone, it cannot be considered false. While there are numerous object objections to the pragmatic approach to truth, one cannot deny that humans, a deeply biased creature, accept things as true because it makes them feel good or because it makes them feel more important. Of course, this can lead to extreme bias, and the pr and proof of falsehood need not necessarily be accepted as falsification, especially by those who believe their truth. As a result, we as skeptics ought to question any sort of statements that we might be believing just to boost our egos, especially nationalistic, elitist, and religious rhetoric that provides you a sense of superiority over others. We must understand that the pragmatic view is often subjective in nature, and this worldview must remain acutely aware of the objective-subjective divide, as we are all subjective creatures with our own inherent biases. Objective knowledge can only be obtained through the, pro through the process of our subjectively learning it and breaking down those subjective barriers impeding us on the path toward objectivity. A central principle of realism is the understanding that one's beliefs have no bearing on reality, and things can be true whether or not one believes them to be. When considering objectivity, we can begin to categorize facts and falsehoods. First, we have things like brute facts, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, and light takes 8 minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. These are true no matter what, but there are also institutional facts that require some sort of legal or religious system enforcing them. For instance, the statement, we are married, is an institutional fact that is only real as long as some collective accepts its validity. And of course, falsehoods are those things that have no bearing on reality. However, some people accept certain falsehoods as facts, and others accept certain facts as falsehood. In order to understand this further, we need to assess the intersubjective layer of reality again, right? Uh, the interest, it, you know, it in, again, it entails the facts, falsehoods, values, beliefs, and heuristics that a group all collectively accepts as true, even if they are indeed false. To illustrate this, we can draw on the Catholic-Protestant conflict. As Luther had a problem with the Catholic Church's understanding of transubstantiation, among other things. And transubstantiation is the process of the bread and wine becoming the body and blood of Christ once ingested. At the time, Catholics had an, a literal interpretation of that and treated it as a brute fact in their intersubjective realm that the bread and wine truly transform, whereas Luther sought a more figurative interpretation. Luther pointed out an inconsistency that altered the intersubjective layer in Europe at that time and set the stage for the rise of new intersubjective realities and more than a century of brutal warfare. We must spend much time forming our own intersubjective layer if there is to be any success. The values and ideas that I've outlined in the axiology have no bearing on reality if they are not accepted as true among a collective. Human rights are not a brute fact. They are institutional facts that effectively do not exist if there is no institution in place to protect them. We even see the workings of intersubjectivity in Nietzsche's God is dead statement. As Nietzsche was not talking about an actual God being dead, but the death of God within the community's intersubjective layer, as the people of Nietzsche's time were then more guided by economics and a new rise of nationalism than by the edicts of the church. 
Anyway, the point is that we need to start working the axiology and epistemology into the intersubjective layer of society if there is to be any success in creating a truly nonpartisan civilized worldview. If you find these ideas at all intriguing, it's important to begin incorporating them into your directing mind and allowing them to guide your thought and action. What we have here is not a dogma that should be believed zealously, but a system of observation, as any worldview is, that hopefully enables us to more deeply understand our present situations. So what can be done at a practical level? How can we bring reverence for life, interest in history, enlightened selfishness, negative utilitarianism, skin in the game, social contract, public, public service, intersubjectivity, etc., into a cohesive praxeology? We must consider both micro and macro levels. On the micro level, we need to cultivate our directing minds and attempt to achieve enlightenment. And what is enlightenment other than the unlearning of all the falsehood that you've accepted as fact? On the micro level, it is essential that we at least consider a new major political party, as well as a system of skin in the game in politics and finance that ensures a robust society. Let us first begin with the micro level, or the cultivation of the self and the world immediately around us, and the nurturing of our understanding of the big picture. As far as social reality is concerned, can we arrive at any more micro level than our own personal subjective experiences? While there's very much debate about whether or not we have free will, we do know that we have executive control. And here we come to the training and development of the previously mentioned directing mind, right? We are not computers that can have op software uploaded into us instantaneously. The ideas I've discussed so far can only become internalized through exposure and application of them to your everyday life and your analyses of the world around you. If you're interested in what you're hearing, you're not just going to have this world view after one listening. You should read some of the writings that I've cited through these two videos, as they will provide more details of what I'm talking about. One such means of cultivating the mind and deepening one's historical understanding comes from Brazilian philosopher Paulo Freire, conscientization. In an effort to bring widespread literacy to Brazil, Freire formulated an entire pedagogical system based around the idea of conscientization, or the orientation of oneself historically, an act of historicization ultimately, the coming to understand the historical foundation upon which our lives are based. I've tried a bit to help uh, with the first video, and maybe a little bit right now. But push yourself and understand your own personal historical situation. If you're from a poor community, how has it come to be poor? If your family is rich and powerful, how did they ascend to that position? If you're from a hollowed out industrial rust belt community, how is it that your jobs disappeared? If you're from, from Flint, Michigan, how did your water come to be contaminated? And how could someone like Snyder rise to his position in the first place and not face any repercussions afterward? What were the historical circumstances that enabled Trump to generate so much enthusiasm in the first place? In addition to orienting yourself historically, you ought to cultivate your creative abilities and develop your talents regardless of whether they can make you money or not. We know for certain that engaging in these things puts people in a state of flow and provides them feelings of great satisfaction. They are intrinsically satisfying things that people eagerly do regardless of any reward. To draw on Russell again, so far as it lies in a man's own power, his life will realize its best possibilities if it has three things, creative rather than possessive impulses, reverence for others, and the respect for the fundamental impulse in himself. Regardless of your talent or creative inclinations, you should accept them, as repressing them will merely lead to discontent and a sense of regret at not at at not at least having tried. In addition to conscientization and the cultivation of talents, we can, can consider, consider meditation. I understand that it might not be for everyone, but meditation is in no way religious. It's ultimately the process of self-disciplining and controlling the stream of consciousness. I can speak from experience that when starting out with Vipassana, it's quite difficult to keep your mind from wandering. You've succeeded once you're able to control your stream of consciousness for even a minute, let alone five. But just as with any skill, the more you practice, the easier it becomes, and you find yourself going five minutes with these, and eventually ten, and so on, and so on. Now, 
I'm not saying you must meditate, but it's worth trying as it can be helpful for developing self-discipline and focus. And one can even counterintuitively use the methods of Vipassana for another exercise for the directing mind, contemplation. Start out normally by focusing on your breath, but unlike orthodox Vipassana, let your mind wander and see what direction it goes. It's great to read a simulating text before this. Even open your eyes and write down your thoughts, or follow a long train of thought until the end. It's one way of putting yourself into a contemplative flow state. We should also ultimately cultivate emotional robustness. Based on all the triggering, name-calling, and trolling online, it's obvious that too many people are way too emotionally fragile, and retreating into our own bubbles only makes us more so. It's important to understand why you're being triggered, and don't try to avoid it and insulate it. Attempt to overcome it. It really is imperative to ignore people who are deliberately trying to get a rise out of you, for instance. Sometimes when you're triggered, you're justifiably angry, but that doesn't justify responding angrily. Other times, someone's behavior might trigger you because something about it reminds you of something you don't like about yourself, an act called projection. It's important to identify when you're justifiably angry and when you're just hypocritically projecting. I'm not saying I'm above it all either, but I'm working on it. One inherent bias that we really should use our directing minds to overcome and increase empathy is the hot-cold empathy gap. We all have it, and it means that we often act very differently in an excited hot state than we say we would while in a cold state. Essentially, in a cool, calm state, we often say that we would act very differently in a hot state than we actually would while in that hot state. To illustrate this, consider the retrospective vilifying of everyday Germans during the Third Reich. Many people ultimately say that more German Germans should have stood up to resist the Nazis. Now, they might be right, but it's very easy in a cold state here at home, now with the luxury of knowing all the historical details, to say that you would have stood up against Hitler had you been a German at that time. The reality is, the vast majority of people who say this would not have stood up had they actually been in a hot state at the time, with guns being pointed at their children's heads, had there been threats of all sorts in propaganda around the streets at home and at work, the hot-cold empathy gap demonstrates that we ultimately have two selves, an experiencing self and a remembering self to draw on Kahneman. The experiencing self corresponds to the quick, intuitive, type 1 thinking of the dual process model of thought. The experiencing self is the one that is in the moment, actively experiencing everything around. The remembering self, however, corresponds to type 2, or the effortful, deliberative thinking that we also do. The experiencing self is in the moment, whereas the remembering self narrates our experience. It's important to remember that these are often misaligned. We need to work to guide our directing mind in a productive direction, meaning aligning our experiencing and remembering selves. Now that we've touched on a number of, of micro-level things, we can, you know, we can address my, a few macro-level things to think about. I understand I've already gone a bit long here, so I'll keep this section brief and develop it in a subsequent pieces. People complain all the time about how young people only complain about how bad things are and never actually try to effectuate any change. Far from the truth, young people have been integral parts of the Obama campaign for change, the Occupy movement worldwide, BLM, the teacher strikes in Wisconsin and West Virginia, the Sanders campaigns, the fight for 15, the Keystone Pipeline protests, the Youth for Climate movement, and wildcat strikes, and other forms of protest during COVID, among other things. And they've been completely stonewalled every step of the way. To say young people only complain and do nothing is to effectively admit that you haven't been following social or political trends of the past decade or more. That being said, now for some solutions. Importantly, there really must be more political parties. Even in an ideal situation, it is impossible for two political parties to adequately represent more than 300 million people, and our situation is far from ideal. So the health of the society really does depend upon new parties representing the needs of the public, forming, and then joining in coalitions against the two-party duopoly. The two parties have engendered a spirit of a lack of cooperation, but these new parties can encourage working together and forming coalitions to overcome the stagnation that's been incurring in Washington for decades now. 
And they needn't necessarily be parties with huge platforms either. One potential way to, uni to unite people would be to create parties focused on single issues around which a large group of Americans can coalesce. One could make a party for healthcare for all, and one for campaign finance re reform that dissolve once the mission's accomplished. And we also are seeing the formation of the Movement for a People's Party, with a number of notable backers and a really comprehensive platform that certainly seems promising at the very least. Regardless, the U.S. does not need one more party. It needs at least a few more, and hopefully at least one will be negative utilitarian in nature, as the MPP seems to be. The conditions have been ripe for a third party since at least 2016, and Americans are ready. In addition to new political parties, we can also consider a form of entrepreneurship that's more affordable than standard business building. I'm talking about the idea of worker self-directed enterprises, WSDEs, as discussed by Richard Wolff. This kind of enterprise entails every worker, managers and laborers alike, owning the company. All the members of the enterprise are their own board of directors, giving labor a significant say in the direction of the company. It's not some abstract idea either, as WSDEs and other worker co-ops have had success in Cleveland, Madison, Oakland, and Seattle, and countries around Europe. I'm not proposing converting all existing businesses to WSDEs at all, but this could be an effective strategy at local levels to help people overcome hard times. It's simultaneously a micro and macro solution. Entire communities can pull together to make enterprises within their communities. This model can be used for any kind of small business, and small business owners looking to retire can actually sell their businesses to their workers if they so desire. Other promising ideas about micro-level solutions can be found in Mark Blythe and Eric Lonergan's Angrynomics, where they discuss the ideas of sovereign, sovereign wealth funds, dual interest rates, and carbon taxes, among many other things, to set the ship aright. They base their proposals on a lucid analysis of the history of capitalism, explaining how the government was able to extricate the U.S. from the first major crisis of capitalism during the Great Depression, and how the government is ill-equipped to do so now. At a macro level, we can also consider the work of Piketty and his proposal of a global wealth tax, an extremely difficult task, however, considering the power of the nearly $1 trillion tax haven industry. And this money is not productive. It is not circulating within the money supply of the society. It is, in fact, removed from the money supply and kept hidden and stagnant. Taking on this industry is a Herculean effort, and regardless of his, uh, his wealth tax potential e efficacy, Piketty's work demonstrate that there's more than enough money circulating both in the U.S. and in tax shelters to transform the state of affairs around the world, not just in the U.S. Regardless, at a macro level, we really need to consider how to make a system that puts people's skin in the game. As there are too many people in power, what Taleb calls fragilistas, who consistently engage in crisis-inducing behavior all while maintaining their positions of power and wealth. I really don't know what the system would be offhand, but I recommend reading Taleb's work and very much encourage you to read through his ideas and consider how to make yourself more robust and even anti-fragile as an individual as well as how to make the society itself more robust and even anti-fragile. The improvement of the individual and society alike requires collective effort. As you can see, there's a lot we can do. There's no reason to feel entirely hopeless about the future, as there are many things we can do at both micro and macro levels. We have within our means a productive manner of moving forward and should consider the various ways that we can cultivate our directing minds and participate meaningfully in one or a few macro projects. These movements to ameliorate society cannot be about one individual or group unless that group is the U.S. or humanity at large. I do not see tribalism as necessarily bad at all, insofar as a group of a particular identity peacefully unites to fight for a particular cause that improves their particular situations. Tribalism can be productive when channeled in the right direction. While it's important to understand and care about the groups to which we specifically belong, it is also essential to consider that we all belong to humanity as a whole, especially since humanity as a whole has such a significant impact upon ecosystems throughout the planet. We must all spend time reflecting upon ourselves and the world around us, thinking through our relation to the external reality and what reality actually is. We all have consciousness, and that is the common ground that we as humans all share. 
I know that the process of salvaging the American civilization, if it isn't impossible, is at best gradual, as it necessitates that we go against our tribalistic nature in many ways. But if we come to acquire our collective voice and go to the powerful with a concrete plan to transform the society into one that embodies the humanitarian ideals upon which it was founded, at least we can make it seem like the goal is possible. That great figure Jesus of Nazareth said to his followers that he came to them bearing a sword so that they may slay their families. Did this nonviolent sage preaching peace actually advocate slaughter? Of course not. Such a statement must be interpreted figuratively. His word of peace and harmony was the sword meant to slay traditions that justified selfishness, decadence, and violence against outsiders. Is it not high time that we slay some ideas that hold us back as a society and a species? Are we just going to sit there and take it all as the system manufactures us to do, to be the easily manipulated masses that Hume describes? Or are we going to take up the powerful arms of ideas and battle against ideas and attitudes that hold us back. Let us spare a moment to sojourn within our minds and reflect upon the ideas discussed in this essay to see if and how they can be used constructively to improve the human condition.